sermon is entitled Stories of Finding the Lost. Uh, truly, it's a good lesson. <laughs> um, let me get here. Hold on, I don't want to lose my place. Y'all pray for me. Our lesson this morning and our central truth is Christ seeks and saves the lost. And our Bible focus is, I, Jesus, say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. What's this lesson about? Today's lesson contains three parables Jesus told after he was criticized for associating with people the Pharisees considered sinful. The stories were all regarding things that were lost but were later found. He showed how the loss of something, the loss of something one loves can bring great sorrow and that finding it brings celebration and rejoicing. The key verse to the lesson is Luke 15 and 10, which notes that all of heaven rejoices when lost sinners return to their heavenly thought. <coughs> Hallelujah. I tell you what, if we were able for our spiritual eyes to be open when we knelt at that altar and truly repented of our sin, if we could have seen spiritually what was all around and what was happening in heaven, I don't know if we could have contained it. <laughs> the joy and the rejoicing that was going on when one sinner repented of their sins and turned to Jesus. You know, that's something to think. How much, you know, people, I don't know if we rejoice enough when a sinner comes to the altar because all of heaven is rejoicing, God is happy. And all the angels are rejoicing because one sinner has come to God. I want you to think about that. Well, let's get into this lesson and see what God has in store. I added these scriptures that are not in the printed text, and I'm going to read them because it's talking about why Jesus is telling these parables. It's in Luke 1, and it's simply, it's in your lesson, but it's not in the printed text. Luke 15 and 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, And then we're going to get into the printed lesson. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise shall be in Likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over the ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. Did not the Lord say that he come to save them? You know, them that are, are not sick don't need a physician. But them that are lost, them that are sinners, them that are outcasts, and in, in that day, they uh, the sinners and the publicans, and the Jewish people, they were not welcome into the Jewish tradition of religion of that day. They were looked down upon and frowned upon. And here Jesus is. He's teaching them. He's preaching to them. He's going to their houses. He's sitting at meat with them, eating with them, and spending time with them. That was a no, no, no in that day. You just didn't do that with these outcast sinners and these Gentiles and these publicans. That was a no-no. But our Lord, he didn't see them as that. He seen that they were lost. He seen that they were sick, that they needed a savior, that they needed a physician, that they needed healing for body and soul. Oh, 
hallelujah. I want you to think about that. I just, I, I don't know, studying this lesson, I, I, I told some that when I was studying, I said, there's really something here that we as Christians really need to get a hold of, and I don't know if I can bring it out like, <laughs> like it really needs to be brought out. But I did read some of the uh, comments in the, in the uh, commentary book here, and I thought they were good, and I'm going to read some of that to you. The church is not a select circle of the, of the immaculate, but a home where the outcasts may come in. It is not a place with gate attendants and challenging sentinels along the entranceways, holding off at arm's length the stranger, but rather a hospital where the brokenhearted may be healed and where all the weary and troubled may find rest and take counsel together. Uh, you know, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you're just going to have to help me with this. And I'm already struggling up here. But I remember reading this this little story, and I'm going to share it with you if I can remember it like it. Like it. I should have went online and found it so I could be real accurate with it. But I understand it was one of the big prominent churches, and, and you know, everything was just so, and everybody had to dress just right, and, and um. Uh, they were all, you might say it was the uppity church. <laughs> well, the pastor decided that he was going to do something to change things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now maybe I can hold my handkerchiefs and <laughs> hallelujah. But anyway, he was going to change things. So one morning before church and everybody was coming in, and there stood a beggar outside the church, and he was wearing worn and tattered clothes. And, and he just looked like a, a homeless, a street person living on the streets. And the people would come in, and they would walk by him and just shun him and look down on him and wondering, what was he doing here? And he's just hanging around outside the church. And, and people just ignored him. And, and look down on him. You know what? If we're guilty of that, we don't have the right heart for God. We don't have the heart of God that if we will look down on the lost and the sinner and, and, and even the homeless on the street. But as the people filed in and they sat down and then in a little bit, the homeless man come walking through and he took a seat. And the, and the people just looked at him like, disgusting, you know? Like, he, he needs a bath. What is he doing sitting in here on our pews? The nasty old man, you know? Think about it. Well, in a little bit, it was time for the pastor to bring his message. And everybody looked around wondering, where's our pastor at? Well, anyway, it was time for him to take the pulpit. The old homeless, beat up, tattered old bum walked to the pulpit and began to give his message. <laughs> Can you imagine the shock on the looks of those people when they realized that was their pastor who had dressed up like an old tattered old bum to come in and bring the message? <laughs> you think about it, people. We don't know. You know, when you mistreat somebody or look down upon them, what are you doing? Do you think that's pleasing to God? I don't think so. Oh, hallelujah. But then I think about that shepherd, that shepherd that went looking for that lost sheep. You know, every one of those sheep meant something to him. He had a hundred sheep, and every one of them meant. And he would, you know, we, we might lay down at night and say, one sheep, two sheep, and we count sheep to fall asleep. But that shepherd would count those sheep to make sure they were all there in the fold. You know, he would count his sheep. And in this parable that Jesus told, he realized one was missing. 
So he took and he said, I'll go look for that one lost sheep. And he took and we went and he looked. And uh, I don't know if you've heard the song, The Shepherd's Call, I think the Crab family sang it. It's a beautiful song. And I knew I had it up there, but I couldn't find it. I was going to play that this morning. But I want you to think about, you and I were that lost sheep that had gone astray. I was that lost sheep gone astray. You were that little lamb that Jesus come looking for. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) He didn't come. He didn't go looking for them that were high and heady and high-minded and thought, I'm a good person. I keep the law. I'm just everything that God wants me to be. I'm special. I'm his chosen people. Oh, dear God, help us. Yet, you know what? Being so blind, so naked and blind, but they could not even see their own problem, that what they had, they did not have the love and the mercy of God dwelling in their heart. But that shepherd went looking for that sheep, and no doubt, He had to go in places that were treacherous. And maybe when he finally found that little sheep and it was barely hanging on to a limb where it had fell over the cliff. I don't know about you, but you and I fell over that cliff. I was the one that Jesus come looking for. And so were you. And that little lamb, he's holding on with all his might, trying to keep from falling on. He's holding on to that limb. He's got that that what do you call it he's holding on to that last straw of hope that last thread of hope and then he hears the shepherd's call he hears the shepherd calling and he says i'm here little one and i'm gonna save you from from death from falling onto the cliffs and and he even risked his life as he tried to hold something and reach down and pick up that little lamb and when he when he got him No doubt the little lamb had scratches and cuts and he was bruised. I don't know about you, but I was bruised and I was scratched up and marred by the sin of the world. But I want you to think about that little lamb and the good shepherd, our Lord, took him and put him on his shoulder and he took him back to the fold rejoicing and saying, I found the one that was lost and brought him back to the fold. And that's the other point of this lesson, the rejoicing that is going on in heaven over one lost soul coming to Jesus. You know, we don't think about the masses coming to Jesus, but he's concerned about one lost soul coming to him. Never feel like that you're nobody to the Lord, that you're insignificant to him because he come looking for me. He come looking for you. The good shepherd come looking for you and I. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, Lord, I praise you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let me see if I can see what I wanted to read with that note. Hallelujah. The ravages of sin are not pleasant, but they are what Jesus came to forgive and heal. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Yet Christians often hesitate to reach out to those who are different. They want God to clean the fish before they catch them. And you know, that's what we have to be careful of. You know, Come as you are to the Lord and let God and the sweet Holy Ghost work with our heart. He does the cleaning. You and I can't clean nobody up, you know? And and, and when you got cleaned up, it was because you allowed the good shepherd to wash you with his precious blood and cleanse your soul. You and I did not have the power to cleanse ourselves. It took the blood of Jesus. Oh, what a great prize. I'm going to go on to the second part of the lesson. Um, I don't know if this is a hindrance or what. Um, Anyway, the next part of the lesson is about finding a lost coin. And before I get into that, I want you to think about this. This little woman had ten, ten pieces of silver. 
and she lost one. I'm going to read the scripture. But she lost one. And in that day, in that time that she lived, I uh, understand one piece of silver would sustain her for, I can't remember if it said it uh, was worth a day's wages or a week's wages. But anyway, it represented her livelihood, what she had to take care of her and her household. But that, that's the thought that come to me. So that one piece, of, that one coin that she couldn't find was precious to her. Sister Marie, that was like maybe you're down and out and you lose your food stamp card and you're on food stamp. Maybe you lost your card. That card you better find or get a new one to even go to the grocery store and get your, your food for your family. Finding a lost coin, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently, diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her, her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. You know, in these parables, the Lord keeps reminding us of the great joy <laughs> that's going on in heaven and with the angels because what the one lost sheep was found, which basically represents you and I as well, that one lost sheep, and then... Here she has, she's lost her piece of silver that meant to sustain her. But listen, and, and when she found it, she called her friends, her neighbors, <laughs> to happy, rejoice. Hey, <laughs> think about it. She had to feed her family, and that was to take care of their needs. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, next part of our lesson. Well, let me bring out this before I, I do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, where is it? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you and praise you, Jesus. Well, anyway, it brought out, and I read in the commentary how that she took that little lamp and that candle, and she lit that candle. You know, she had to have light to find that which was lost. And, you know, you and I must have that light to come to the knowledge of the Lord. And that candle represents that that light that Christ shines in on us. She's using that light to find that which is lost. And Jesus Christ is that light that we find what we need from the Lord, which is our salvation. <coughs> Hallelujah. I praise you, Jesus. And then, what does the Holy Ghost do when we get saved? He begins to sweep away. You know, she got her broom, and she swept that house, looking diligently for that coin, shining that light on it, and, and sweeping out the house so she would find that coin. You think about it. That sweet Holy Ghost sweeps into our life, and he begins to sweep out the cobwebs and the sin and all those things that are unlovely to God. God, and he works on us, sweeping us. But all oh, think about the joy. I don't know about you, but there was great joy when the Holy Ghost come into my heart and my life. And he helped me to sweep. And you know, he's still helping me to sweep away the things that are unlovely to God. You know, anything that is not righteous in our lives. The Holy Ghost keeps shining that light on that and helping us to get those things out of our life. Praise the Lord. The last part of the lesson is finding a lost son. And I think about it, the lost sheep, the lost coin, but what had a greater value than the lost son? Think about it. You know, Jesus told these parables so that he could bring out the truth. But then this last parable is the one that really gets to our heart. Luke 15 and 11 in your lesson, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, 
give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divideth unto them his living. You know, how many messages? Wouldn't it be interesting to know just how many messages has been taught on the prodigal son? Think about it. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You know, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. And this young man will soon find out when he runs out and he spent it all on riotous living, living ungodly, you know, taking his flight away from God you might say God, you know, took his flight away. His father represented God in this story. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Now he's in need. He has no money. He spent it all. Surely he just played around in that world and just wasted all the substance that he had. And when he had spent all, there arose a famine. And he went and joined him, himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. You might say that this job that he took represented uh, in that day of the Jewish people going to the Gentiles. You know, the swine. Only the, only the Gentiles of that day would raise swine. That was, not, that was an unclean animal. And now here he is taking care of the swine. That was the only job he could get. And said when he would fain and had filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. You might say in this parable that God let him hit bottom. <laughs> he done hit rock bottom. And as I heard one little thing said said when we hit rock bottom, then we hit on the rock who is Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> that rock bottom, you know, and another song says about being between a rock and a hard place. Well, that rock is Jesus. If you're in a hard place, guess what? That's time to look to Jesus. <laughs> we better be looking to him all the time. But I want you to think about it. <clears throat> He's running from God's will. He's running from his father. He wants to go out there and have a big party and have a big time. Well, here he's hit rock bottom. And listen, and when he came to himself, <laughs> I don't know about you, when I hit rock bottom, but when I came to myself <laughs> and there was nowhere to hide, nowhere to run, you can't hide from the, the God dealing with your heart. I'll never forget how God dealt with Brother Bill and I. Some people would not believe it. But his own preaching of the past actually condemned our soul and brought us under conviction. Your own preaching bring you under conviction. The preaching of the past. Oh, think about it. You know what? That preached word, that anointed word will not come back void. You can go and take them CDs and you can listen to them over and over. And that anointed word is still there. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. He came to himself and he said. <laughs> and I've been there, people. I remember speaking some words to my sister who's passed on. And he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. <clears throat> I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He came to himself. He realized what he had back at the father's house. He realized how all his needs were taken care of. He realized, you know, and, and he, you might say this experience has humbled him and wilted him down to where he knows his only hope is to go back to the Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I remember, and I hadn't heard anybody sing it for a while, but any of you remember that song, I Want a Servant's Heart? a servant's heart you know that's what we must have to serve the lord yes we become his children when we get saved and we're joint heirs with christ but at the same time we must have a servant's heart under the lord hallelujah listen and all this part gets so good <laughs> i should have had shania singing for me this morning when god ran but I didn't think about it till just now. <laughs> it's too late for that. It says, and he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet, <clears throat> excuse me, a great way off, his father saw him. <laughs> the Lord <clears throat> saw you when you were a great far off. But yet your heart was getting tender. You wanted to do the right thing and come back. And ask the Lord to forgive you. Hallelujah. Now this, this is more talking to the backslider here. But still, whether you just come to Jesus or you serve the Lord and you backed away from him. Think about it. Oh, hallelujah. His father saw him. Oh, in this part. <laughs> and had compassion. <laughs> and ran. The father ran. <laughs> You know what? We take the start walking towards God. And what does he do? He runs to us to meet us. Oh, hallelujah. You know, we don't go to that altar by ourselves. We take those few steps to get to that altar, but God's running to meet you there. Hallelujah. Listen, the father had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. <laughs> oh what great joy is taking place here and the son said unto him father I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight he's confessing his sin to the father he's telling him I've sinned and I'm no, one, no more worthy to be called thy son but the father said to his servants <laughs> and this is what God does for us hallelujah he says Bring forth the best robe. God now wants to give us his best. He wants to robe us in that robe of righteousness because Jesus' blood hath cleansed us. And now our, our robe of righteousness is that salvation, that coat of salvation that we put on. Oh, hallelujah. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. <laughs> God will put it on you if you let him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Put it on me, Lord. <laughs> and put a ring on his hand. I understand that ring back then was like the family insignia to stamp, you know, legal documents and things and family and orders and things of that nature. He put a ring on his hand hand and shoes on his feet <laughs> oh glory think about it no doubt he was tattered and, and probably walking barefooted he needed shoes on his feet his feet might have been blistered they might have been real sore from walking you know what Sometimes we got to get blistered and sore to come back to God. We got to get where we're sick of sin and we're tired of running. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. He put shoes on his feet. And listen, we're fixing to have a feast here. We're going to celebrate. My son has come home. Hallelujah. The father is so excited. And you know, God is rejoicing when you come to him and give your heart to him. He's happy. He's rejoicing. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For that this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. Oh, my hankies is all over the place. 
I don't know about you, but listen, here's some thoughts I had. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. <laughs> Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And I was blind, but now I can see. <laughs> Hallelujah. That prodigal son may have felt like my dad should be angry with me, but instead he found mercy and forgiveness. You might say that song, Sister Martha. Mercy walked in. Hallelujah. Mercy and forgiveness was waiting for him. And no doubt the change of heart, the repentance he felt was really what it took to change things for him. The most important parable in this lesson is the prodigal son. The lyrics of this song goes along with God allowing us to choose our own path. How many ever ever heard that song, I couldn't make it without him? I'm going to read you this song because I thought, Lord, this goes, this is a song that applies to me. He let me try my wings because I asked him to, knowing all the time I couldn't fly. He gave my feet their liberty and let them walk their way. And all the time I never asked him why. The chorus goes like this, but now I am beginning to understand. He bought my life and he already had it planned. Oh, foolish me, I could not see. Sin had my vision dimmed. But he let me go just so I would know that I couldn't make it without him. He let me choose my footsteps down the road of life. But farther from his care, my feet did trod. Think of the prodigal running from God. The easy way was bright and gay without a cross to bear. But my road took me far away from God. But now I'm beginning to understand. You know, the wisdom of the Lord is the beginning of understanding people. He bought my life and he already had it planned. Oh, foolish me. I could not see. Sin had my vision dimmed. <laughs> but he let me go, just like the father gave the son. And he let him go. <laughs> he let him go. He says, my son's got to learn a lesson. I got to let him go out on his own. But he let me go just so I would know that I couldn't make it without him. We, like the lost sheep, had gone astray. But God in his mercy came looking for me. He came looking for me. He came looking for you. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. God, I praise you. Lord, I thank you. You came looking for me. Listen, I got just a few more thoughts to share here, and I'll open the floor. And like the woman who had lost one of her ten pieces of silver, she sought diligently to find our Lord paid the ultimate price to come look for us. And then having known the father, the prodigal son wanted to taste of the wild side of life. But then he found he had made it, he had it made back at home with dad and family. <coughs> All these examples goes to prove how much God loves us. His sheep, his precious silver, and his wayward son. My last thought here is what are we seeking for? You know, we see what God's seeking for. He's seeking for us. He came looking for me. He came looking for you. But what are we seeking? God proved his love. Are we seeking for that precious treasure, which is Jesus? You know, we might pile it up down here on earth. We might work to have this and have that and a big bank roll and a nice fine house and car. You know, and all the things and the pleasures of the world and the things of the world. But listen, 
we, if we don't find Christ, we have missed seeking for the greatest treasure that there ever was, and that was a relationship with Jesus. <coughs> he said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. Are we too lazy or foolish to seek? Are we too proud to ask? Are we just plain don't want to know? <laughs> Last of all, search our heart and ask, what are we doing to seek the lost? What are we doing to seek the lost sheep, the lost son? Are we too content to stay in our comfort zone? If the sinners and the backsliders fail to come to the light, should we be willing to take the light to them? Jesus was willing to go amongst the sinners. He was willing to sit down and eat with them. He was willing to be there in their midst to be able to teach and shed light where they needed light, where they needed healing, where they needed saving. Listen. If the sinners and the backsliders fail to come to the light, should we be willing to take the light to them? We might get accused of hanging out with sinners and drunkards. They told Jesus he was hanging out with the, with the drunkards and the, and the wine bibbers. And truly, I wouldn't advise a brand new Christian to go where they would be tempted to go back to old habits. You know, God will lead us out there to them when he knows he can trust us to hold on to him and to be a light to others. The, the new Christians, they first must get strong and established in the Lord. The other thing is let God lead where and when you should go. How much time we got, Brother Billy? Got time for a couple, two or three comments? Anybody? Oh, thank God for saving me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, brother. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 